Ready? He's got open man. DJ Moore. End zone. Touchdown. Touchdown, Bears. I am Jeff Joniak. Blitz is on. <laughs> Down he goes. Brisker. What was it like playing for Coach Dicka? Uh, I don't want to answer any questions like that. Pressure coming. He's in big trouble. Down he goes. No. Montez Sweat. No way. And ta-da, and ta-da, and ta-da. Now, Bears Etc. brought to you by Geico. With the voices of the Bears, Jeff Joniak and Tom Thayer. Surviving the uncertainty of a season opener is on the to-do list of every NFL team, and the Bears did just that in comeback fashion, turning a 17-point deficit into a 24-17 win over the Tennessee Titans at Soldier Field on Sunday. With Super Bowl winning Bears guard Tom Thayer, I'm Jeff Joniak, and welcome to Episode 92 of the Bears Etc. Podcast. That is brought to you by Geico. Total team win, Big Tom. And I got to say, highlighted by that suffocating second half defense, but the game changing special teams plays and an offense that scuffled, but they finished and they didn't turn the ball over. You know, you got to be really be impressed with what you saw out of the defense because a lot of us were thinking, are they going to be able to pick up where they left off last year? And they did that and more. They had some new pieces in place that really helped the rotation of the defensive line. The defensive backs played as well as we thought they could, and the linebackers were as impressive as they left off. So there's a lot of super encouraging things there. And then Coach Hightower, the special teams coordinator, had his guys ready to play. They made super impactful plays. They created field position that I think as the season winds on, they'll be able to capitalize on it. And then when you take a look at the offense, there's some really correctable issues that can be done immediately. But it is going to take reps, it's going to take time, and it's going to take some practice effort. So as many, uh, there's a lot of encouraging things out there, and there's a lot of correctable things out there. Coming up in a moment, we'll hear from head coach Matt Eberflus like we will each and every Monday right here from Hallis Hall. Uh, the 17-point comeback, by the way, ties for the fourth largest in Bears history and ties for the second largest at home, 2001, against the 49ers. So that's the courtesy of Doug Coletti. The Doug Coletti math, Tom. We always have a little Doug Coletti math, our great and famous statistician and director of research. Tastes like Miller time. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories and 3.2 carbs per 12 ounces. Uh, and by the way, congratulations on the great job you did at halftime. Uh, that was a great ceremony. You nailed it. Nice speech about Steve McMichael, the presentation of the Hall of Fame rings uh, that all the Hall of Famers get uh, in the home stadiums uh, during the year that they are inducted into the Hall of Fame, the enshrinement, of course, back in in August. And that'll happen again in October for Devin Hester. But uh, it, it had to be a great moment for you because of your relationship and what that brother of yours means to you, Steve McMichael. Yeah. You know, it was awesome. I got a really nice appreciation message last night in the middle of the night from his wife, Misty. Oh, nice. And, uh, and I appreciate that because she knows how much Steve mean means to me, um, as a football player, as a person in my life and my, in our afterlife together, um, he's like a brother to me. And so I would do anything for Steve. And listen, speaking in front of that many people is not putting in my comfort zone. However, when I have given the opportunity to speak on behalf of Steve McMichael, I would do it anywhere, anytime. Well, you did a great job. All of it was great. And uh, so was the second half. Uh, the Bears defense. Let, let's dig in a little deeper. You mentioned picking up where they left off, and they have. And, and the three takeaways also picking up where they left off last year. Uh, they have, have really put together a stretch, and uh, it has led to, uh, you know, dating back to last year, eight wins in the last 14 games. So 8-6 and six was a whole lot better than starting 0-4 last year, and so they're off to a good start. they got a roadie in Houston to deal with and a whole bunch of offensive weapons. But digging in, Matt Eberflus uh, is doing a great job calling the plays. Pressure when necessary deploying Brisker, deploying Gordon on a blitz. Brisker had 10 tackles. You saw what T.J. Edwards did, limiting everything after the catch and everything after the run, and then just getting a variety of players having a say in the outcome of that game. We can go up and down the line of scrimmage and some underrated aspects, including Demarcus Walker, who hit the quarterback four times. 
Yeah. Well, you know, thank goodness for the fan support because the building has back in ownership of the Chicago Bears. And with that supportive of a crowd with that type of defense, you can win a lot of games with that. And every single member of the defensive line had an impact in this game, whether it's on special teams or in regular defense. We wanted to see the maturation process of Jervon Dexter. And I think the second or third play of the game, he made a play, had a couple of other big plays in the game. So it's super important impressive that they've been able to put together an efficient and effective rotation on the defensive line because there's nothing as demoralizing to an offensive line with a solid rotation of fresh defensive linemen that can play in your home city as well as they did but go on the road and play equally as well all right we got a lot more to discuss but let's pick it up right here with head coach Matt Eberflus today at Hallis Hall all right, Matt, welcome back to our podcast, the Bears Etc. podcast. Uh, we're already up to 92 episodes of this, so this one celebrates a nice win. Week one against Tennessee Titans. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Oh, As always, we'll be here uh, every week of the season. Uh, finding a way to win, obviously, despite adversity, which you mentioned even before the game, you got to overcome adversity as a, as a bigger win in my book uh, because you guys finished, and it's a good platform to work from. Is this how you look at this? Yeah, no doubt. You know, we always look at the performance. You know, you know, right now after the game, you can't control the score. The score is what it is, and uh, we look at performance, and that's about partnering up with your position coach and what you did well. You know, keep doing those types of things, and then really about what you can improve on. There's every performance uh, you can you can get better, and it's our time now for reinvestment uh, going into this week and uh, and growing and improving on our fundamentals and improving as a football team. You mentioned uh, after the game the look in the eye of the players at halftime. Was there something said by players that uh, also piqued your curiosity in terms of uh, any individual, if you care to say, like what, what happened in there at halftime? No, it wasn't really an individual. Okay. I would just say that it was just the whole collective group, you know, in terms of looking at each other and say, hey, we can get this done. We believe in each other. Uh, we know how hard, we, hard we've worked during training camp and since April, and uh, just that belief uh, that it, that we're able to get it done. Yeah, I was listening to some uh, an analyst just looking at the league overall, former players saying, hey, there's always an overreaction to week one, win or lose, right? There's so much to work out. Players are, are playing the most snaps they've played the entire offseason. It's, it's a process, all of this. You're, you got to figure out who you are as a player, first of all, with your team because every team's new every year and just where everything fits. Is this a proper way to look at the lens of a week one in the NFL? Yeah, I, I think it is. And uh, obviously coming out with a victory is is, is good. Yes. Because <laughs> you want to start fast and you want to do that. And you're really just evaluating your winning formula you know, for success. And that changes a little bit every single week, but it's all rooted in fundamentals. And, and then where can you improve? And I think that's uh, for offense, for defense, for kicking. You know, There's a lot of improvement that we can have from week one to week two, and we're excited about getting going on it this week. All right, in, into the nitty-gritty of the game. I, I, I'm looking at this, and I don't know how you feel about key series for me. It's a ninth possession offensively. At your 11, you get two first downs on a six-play drive to the Tennessee 43, but you punt and pin the Titans at the 18-yard line. So they got a long field to work with and 60-something seconds left in the game. Uh, that was an important offensive series. And, Very, and, yeah. You know, it started with DJ. You know, DJ, they threw it out to him, and he obviously made a nice move um, and had that explosive to get it off. I believe it was the 10-yard line, I believe, and uh, really good to be able to flip the field there. Obviously, you know, we have a punter that can do that and, uh, you know, make him go the long, hard way, and uh, offense did a really nice job there. Special teams was truly special. It was. We can go down the list, but uh, I, I'm fond of this player – just getting to know him a little bit, Daniel Hardy. Uh, he played 24 special teams snap. He had a snap on defense as well, got a tackle. But the block punt, may, you could say, is the turning point in the game. Yeah, and I'm very happy for him because of the kind of guy he is and the work ethic he has. Um, he's our he's our kind of guy in terms of that. Uh, he bleeds the hits principle. And uh, so excited for him to be able to go out there and perform the way he did in terms of his effort, his intensity, and production. And it was good to see. What's the coach's point on how you block a punt? Well, his, his get off was outstanding. You know, and he's he's really strong at the point. You know, he was able to turn the shoulders uh, of the protector, and then be able to bend in there to the to the to the block point. And he did a really good job reaching out and putting his hand on the football. You know, and then Jo did a wonderful job of scooping and scoring. Uh, we work on that. Obviously, you see the practices. We work on that fundamental skill every single day, and uh, and doing it with full speed. 
you know, and then bursting for three hard steps, and the guys did that. And, and it's not a surprise when it happens in the game. You've already done it, game speed, and, and that was a really good recovery. Yeah, I spoke to him after the game, and he, he mentioned that very fact. We do this every single day. Uh, but that ball does bounce funny sometimes. So, I, you know, I can't minimize the skill and the concentration and just scoop that. He didn't even know he had a touchdown. He's like, this is too easy. Like, he just scooped and scored, and that's yeah. it. He's looking around, making sure. Uh, and, and conversely, on Tyreek's pick six, he said he blacked out, meaning he didn't hear anything. He just, it's just like everything went quiet. Yeah. Which is weird because everything was not quiet. Well, I think that's when you get into the flow of the game and uh, he was, was hyper-focused on that particular play and he was just in the zone there. And uh, Tyreek's got great hands and, he, and he's a really good corner for us and we're excited about the rest of the year for him. By the way, on Owens, uh, Tom made a great, uh, you know, a great call. I have to, yeah, that was a gold medal play, you know, in, in honor – of his misses, Simone Biles. So, gold medal play by a gold medal player. Uh, DeAndre Carter, got experience. There's a lot of trust there. Uh, his day overall, very impressive. 67-yard kickoff return and 12.8 on punts. Yeah, and uh, again, that goes to all the guys that are blocking for him, too. Yep. You know, there's a lot of good uh, guys out there in terms of, like, your effort, second effort, uh, technique, you know, sealing off blocks, double-team blocks, uh, working to the second level, you know, and freeing them, not freeing them up. But, uh, you know, uh, DC's a really good player, though. I mean, he's got he's got quickness. He's got uh, you know burst, cut, cut ability, burst. He's got all those, and uh, he was able to take those punt returns and and that one particular kick return and make something happen. Yeah, now a series of threes, uh, three field goals. Cairo Santos, third place in Bears history now with fourteen career fifty pluses, three inside the twenties for Tory Taylor, and a three tackle day for Jalen Jones. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> all three of those guys played well. And, of course, we know who Cairo is because he's done it for us for a long time. And then, you know, Torrey coming in new on the scene. We've all watched him in practice, and he performed well, too. Ferocious second half defensively. I'm not minimizing what they did in the first half either, but they just really were on it. I look at T.J. Edwards, nothing after the catch, nothing after contact, just drilling guys down to the ground. He appeared to be very um, – Swift to to the ball on every single one of those tackles. Fifteen overall, I think ten solos. Um, what'd you think of that second half defensive performance? They were fiery. Yeah, to go to the first half, you know, we really we had three three and outs, you know, in the first half, which is which is good. Um, yeah, you know, we had a couple drives there. The one big drive we gave up because of that third and fifteen. You know, we just got to do a better job of matching up those routes. Uh, Ridley did a really nice job of of kind of tucking behind one of our defenders there. Um, so we could have gotten out of there. And then we also had another drive where we had a, a penalty on a four-point play. It was a third and five or whatever it was, and we ended up jumping offside. So some of those were self-inflicted. we got to clean those things up. And then moving on to the second half, I love the way the guys responded, you know, coming out um, in the second half, the way they tackled, the way they kept leverage, the way they hustled. And, again, it's never good enough, but it was it was, it was was pretty good uh, yesterday in terms of taking the ball away when we needed to. Yep, and, and some of the hidden uh, pressures, like people are not talking about as much, but Demarcus Walker, including the last play uh, that Jalen intercepted, he had four hits on the quarterback, 10, yep. 10 overall. And we got to talk about Daryl Taylor, too. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. We had 14 hits on the quarterback. You missed four, but uh, – but other Official that, stats said ten. Yeah, but the, coaches say fourteen. I'm going with you. There you go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was it was good. Um, you know, those guys you know applied some pressure there, and we're always working four equals one with those with the four man rush, and rush and cover uh, was applied yesterday. We just got to keep working on it. All right. Um, can you talk about how a guy can come in here in this scheme uh, and just play a lot of snaps and get eight tackles and two sacks and play some good football? And Taylor, he he said he just loves the fit. He just he, Go forward. Go get the quarterback. And maybe he didn't have to do that in that manner at Seattle. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Uh, he, he does a really good job with just his energy, his effort, uh, his attention to detail, his focus. Uh, he fits right in with us because of the way he plays. He loves football. And he just He's uh, just 100 miles an hour all the time, which is great. We always can work with that. We'll get that guy in the right direction as we did this week. And uh, going forward, he's going to have a big year for us. Hard to win a game without an offensive touchdown. But. It's a team game, all three phases, and uh, it was a team game. Uh, with that being said, uh, were you close, in your opinion, on some big plays in the passing game? Yeah, we were. We were. I mean, you know, we had uh, Keenan open on that on that double move. Yeah, very on good this, route. On our sideline there, I thought that was really good. We had uh, DC on a max zero pressure. I thought we could have really dumped it in there, you know, um, you know, just dropped it right in there. So there was a couple of plays that we had missed opportunities on. 
But again, that all always comes down to the rhythm, the timing, you know, continuity with the receivers, and and us just having more time on task, and we're going to do that. Yeah, and, and all things that you we were going to expect from a young quarterback, especially one uh, being a rookie quarterback, to face with the speed of the game on a regular season hit. Yeah, and, and again, he's going to keep getting better. You know, yeah. the things he did well was protect the football, one hundred percent, and uh, that was good. He was good in the pocket. Um, his operation was good. His disposition in terms of his demeanor, his body language, everything through all that adversity was great. Um, he responded well, came out there in that two-point play, had a really good execution on that. It was a really good play call by Shane. You know, So there's a lot of positives to take. There was a lot of rhythm and timing throws that were right on point. You know, So there's a lot of positives to take away from it. And there's also things that, hey, we can get better at. Yeah. You know, and It's week one, and we're going to go to week two and, and just keep on reinvesting and growing and improving every single week. And I looked at those 13 uh, third down opportunities. There was a lot of third and threes, third and four, third, you know, shorts. There were some big ones too, third and country mile. But I go back, and I, I know you and I have t- talked about this, I believe, but 199 passing attempts at USC on third and fourth down is final two years, zero interceptions. So, again, zero interceptions, like you said, protecting the football on third down. Cause that can get a little wacky on third down. That, that's huge right there. Um, how was his Monday morning demeanor after this? It was good. It was good. Same as he had last you know, yesterday on the podium. Uh, it was good. We had a nice meeting with him today, uh, this morning, and it was good. Yeah. He was good. We just talked about what, what we could do better and, and what we learned and, and moving on to the next week. All right. The next week is a primetime matchup. Uh, certainly not going to be too big for Caleb Williams. He's been in the primetime his whole life. Uh, for, forget about uh, just uh, the uh, USC and Oklahoma days. Really good football team. You know, we Met them in Canton. Obviously, there's no scouting going on, but you get a little familiarity with the roster at a minimum all the way back to that point in August. Uh, is that helpful in any way? Uh, because uh, this is a really good football team, a lot of talent. Yeah, it's a playoff team, you know, yeah. and they did a nice job in the first game of the year. Uh, very explosive offense. Uh, got, a, got a real similar defense to the way, the way we operate in terms of the, the structure. So it'll be very familiar to him, uh, to Caleb, because um, it's, it's very similar. Uh, but they got you know good edge rushers, good inside pressure players. They got a nice secondary. So, um, and then their complement on offense is they got a nice uh, skill set. You know their skill sets are really good. Acquired a couple good players, and uh, it's going to be a big challenge for a whole football team. Run stuffing always important. Joe Mixon had himself a big day. We know what he can do, so I'm sure that's going to be job one to earn yeah, that right yeah, to no rush doubt. the passer. No doubt. All right, Matt. Congratulations. Talk to you next week. Enjoy right, your prep. You. All right, he corrected me, as you heard, Tommy. Uh, 14 hits on the quarterback. Uh, the final stat said 10. He's going to take every one of those quarterback hits, especially when you're talking about a second-year quarterback like Will Levis, where pressure really did affect him in 2023. And until further notice, uh, you know, those are the kind of uh, punishment you got to provide on a quarterback. Make sure you're clouding his windows, clouding his ability to escape the pocket, and uh, force him into these errors where he's feeling the pressure. And like he did when he just threw that ball, he was just trying to throw the ball away. And uh, he was going down to the ground, and Tyreek Stevenson there for the pick six. But those are, those are plays he'll learn from as a quarterback. But you want to force these second-year young quarterbacks who don't have a lot of starts bankrolled into making these kind of errors. Well, even experienced quarterbacks, you want to – be able to provide unpredictable pressure because even though you go to the line of scrimmage as an opponent and you have your direction of your protection called and you know exactly who you want to protect against, you, the Bears have a wide variety of weapons that they can bring from a lot of different directions that sometimes they are unpredictable. And then that interferes with the timing of the play. And then all of a sudden, the win of the play is on behalf of the defense. So I like what the group of athletes are able to do here. In the worst thing as a as an ex-offensive player is when you have a superstar in your defense and you know who exactly who you have to stop, but now you got a variety of guys in the Bears. There's 11 guys here that can put pressure on a quarterback at any time because they all have that type of versatility built into them. All right. Are you surprised by the immediate impact of Daryl Taylor at all? No, I'm not because you have to look at the other other the other pieces that are in place on the defensive line and at the linebacker position and then Kyler Gordon and Jaquan Brisker and such. So if everybody is influenced by making sure that you block Montez Sweat and you 
uh, direct your protection towards him, that means somewhere along the line, somebody's going to get a one-on-one no matter what. And if you're the backside defensive end and you're getting that one-on-one and you win as immediately as he did it throughout the course of the game yesterday, now you're talking about the offensive coordinator trying to devise a new scheme of where to slide the pressure to. And then all of a sudden, then you look and you go, oh, you got Montez Sweat on the other side of the line of scrimmage, and then you got Demarcus Walker, and you got Darnell Taylor. You got all these guys switched on the opposite side of the field. So that's what I'm talking about is the unpredictable pressure are because you have a group of athletes that are so well-balanced that they can play out of a right-handed stance as well as a left-handed stance. Do you think they did a nice job of uh, changing the picture for Will Levis back there, uh, taking away his deep ball game. I mean, there was one, but you know, given what he did last year, he put up the ball quite a bit uh, on deep routes. Granted, uh, Dron J. Hopkins probably wasn't 100% ready to play. He just was out there. He really didn't get factored into the game at all, and not because the Bears were taking him away, I don't believe. But, you know, Calvin Ridley can make some noise, obviously, and Tyler Boyd out of the slot is awful dangerous. But I think they, they kind of clouded the pictures for him a little bit. You're perfect. Yeah, exactly right. They clouded the picture for them because as he breaks the huddle and he knows the plays he called in the huddle, he goes to the line of scrimmage and maybe you have TJ Edwards and Tremaine Edmonds up at the line of scrimmage. They have no intentions on rushing, but they got to be accounted for because where they're lined up before the snap of the ball. And as soon as they drop back into their pass coverage lanes, plus you have the complimentary of the other defensive backs. Now the quarterback is in a thinking position as he's dropping back. And when you think, you're B. And so that's the one thing about the uniqueness of the Bears and the athleticism they have from the edges to the inside that they can put a, a variety of fronts up there that, would you say, the clouds your uh, yeah. cloud your Change vision? the pictures. Change the picture. Yeah. You know, yep. change the picture. By the way, 3 of 14 on third down defensively uh, by the Bears limiting the Titans, so didn't stack up a bunch of other plays uh, because for a while there they had the time of possession advantage uh, Tennessee quite a bit. Uh, good running game. Uh, Tony Pollard early in the game, but the Bears adjusted significantly in the second half. And the game is all about adjustments and adaptation as well. We're brought to you by PNC, official bank of the Bears. Let's dig into special teams. Uh, there's so much here because, uh, and I, I talked with Coach about everybody from the three inside the 20 punts to Jalen Jones on the tackles to Cairo hitting all three of his to a new long snapper. Uh, you know, that's a, that's yeah. an introduction to things and Scott Daly, 10 kickoffs combined in the game, just three touchbacks. So, you know, uh, let's get into that because 34% up until the Monday night game, 34% of the kickoffs were returned up from 20% a year ago in week one, one for a touchdown in week one, only four for a touchdown, all of 23. So I don't know how many teams are going to embrace this, uh, but the Bears and Titans did. And when the Titans perspective, it led to a, 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 a turnover. And, and Julius Chestnut recovering the Bayless Jones muff. So this is, uh, you know, we talked about this. There's going to be some really big plays that are going to have an impact on the game. It's going to change tempo, momentum, field position. And I, I, I just hope that teams don't settle for that touchback and get the ball at the 30-yard line and be good with it because there are built-in, there's built-in big moments awaiting either team in one of these uh, kickoffs. Well, I mean, if you're just willing to award your the, your opponent every single series that you're kicking off to them a free first down, now you're changing the influence of field position. And when you have a punter, say, like Torrey Taylor, that if you start at the 30-yard line and say you only get seven or eight yards out of a drive and then he's banging the ball from field position, that can reverse it. So I, I still like the fact that they're – that you're going to create more kickoff returns. I like the design of some of the returns by Coach Hightower in week one of the NFL. So then that's just going to increase the exploratory surgery of all these special teams coaches because they're not only going to look at their own or their opponent, they're going to look at them right down the line of every team in the league if they say, wow, this is interesting. I'm going to experiment with this. Because, listen, offensive football is a copycat league, and so is the design of the new kickoff return 
Your little line about uh, Jonathan Owens, and I just saw him uh, before we started the podcast here, uh, all smiles on his face about the scoop and score for the touchdown of the block by Daniel Hardy. Gold medal worthy. That was a great line by you. He's the professional football player. Simone Biles is the superstar gymnast and multi-talented gold medal winner. Thrilled. I think uh, she was screaming at the top of her lungs when that husband of hers Ran it into the end zone. That was a great was, play. Hey, she was screaming no louder than me because <laughs> I was equally as excited when I saw that because it's just not a play that comes up very often. And then you think of the combination of names. They weren't on the Bears last year. And here you got Daniel Hardy, and then you got Jonathan Owens. You're talking about two newbies that have been brought aboard that, wow, what the heck is going on here? Yeah, good, good, good guys that uh, really play hard. That's one thing we saw in preseason as well when Jonathan Owens gets a chance to get on the field at safety he'll punch you he will hit you he, he leaves a mark and he's, he's going to do that he's going to get his teams. chances I yeah. mean you know this is not an injury free league here so if you have to come in for a series of play or a game when Jonathan Owens gets his opportunity to play be be ready busy heart seltzer flavors for every vibe celebrate responsibly Molson Coors Beverage Company Milwaukee Wisconsin we should also mention DeAndre Carter a new bear as well yep. put together a nice line uh, in punt and kickoff return. All right, let's talk about the offense. I'm going to start from a, a, a point of positivity that I mentioned with Coach Flus. The ninth offensive possession of the game by the Bears. It was only six plays, Tommy, but they got the ball to the Tennessee 43 and ate it up uh, almost four minutes. It left the Titans 65 seconds in a long field, which resulted in the game-ending interception by Jalen Johnson, and you take the knee the rest of the game. That included those two's first downs might have made a difference in the outcome because you're talking about field position. You're talking about time on the clock. And I thought uh, that was a very important series right there, given the fact they did not pass the ball to their liking and they did not put a ball in the end zone offensively. That was a big series. You agree? Oh, listen, there's a lot of plays that go untalked about that are big plays in the game that factor in the outcome. And you talked about you talk about those big plays and those first downs and getting that clock to continue to wind when you work on four minute drills and stuff. But I as I was watching the tape, I was looking at the fumble recovery by Tevin Jenkins. Okay, so a ball gets batted by a defensive back. It gets caught by Roma Dunze. It gets stripped by a Tennessee Titans. As Tevin's going downfield to help block if he has to, the ball's on the ground and he recovers it, and then they end up getting three points out of that. Mm -hmm. As you were talking, maybe it was last night, about the series that they ended up getting nine points from, yeah. and that's three of the points. I was just thinking, okay, the plays that you're just talking about near the end of the game, that play by Tevin Jenkins, they're big plays that will never get talked about, never get awarded or rewarded, but they factor in a win. All right. It underscores the hustle aspect of the hits Correct. principle, and so that is important to be on this football team. Yeah, the three series I talked about, I don't have them memorized at the moment, but one was an 11-play drive. Another one was a nine-play drive. It did not net a lot of yards. There was a one yard net series, but those three series rather led to nine points and you needed those nine points to win the football game. Caleb had great opportunities, some great throws to DJ Moore, really impressive rip at slant. Uh, the big catch on the sidelines when he had to take his helmet off and go into the tent and some near misses because there were a bunch of third and shorts, third and three, third and four, third and five that they decided to throw it downfield as opposed to maybe an intermediate throw, and it were just a little off. So it, it, it actually, while we were doing our game night live show, I think I mentioned I was feeling, as we were talking about the game, I was feeling more optimistic about the performance because he didn't turn the ball over. Caleb did not, the offense did not turn the ball over. So that's step one. Step two, there are some near misses. Okay, the protection at times, it did break down. And there were some big dudes up front that we know about. Jeffrey Simmons we knew about. Now we learned about Tavondre Sweat. Tough to deal with. You know, another misnomer is just to address it because the, the interior defensive linemen of the Tennessee Titans are going to give a lot of football teams a lot of problems. They're big men. They complement each other well. And they're good against the run as good as good against the pass. So the first tip ball that uh, Caleb had. So – 
uh, af- after Coleman Shelton snapped the ball, he got tripped by one of his own offensive linemen. As he was falling backwards, the guy he was blocking luckily put his hands up in the air and tipped the ball. And then the second tip ball was the defensive lineman ran a stunt. The offensive line picked it up perfectly. One of the defensive linemen that got stale made it to the line of scrimmage kind of guessed and put his hands up and it resulted. So it's not like, oh my God, he's thrown into the back of the helmets of his own offensive lineman. It's defensive linemen being put in a fortunate position and then they put their hands up in a desperation move and they are able to get their hands to it. So I know that's something that's correctable, uh, but you know, it's, you know, correctable more by the offensive line than the quarterback. Well, you know, if you're a good defensive line, you're rushing the quarterback and you're stalemate, you got to put your hands up. That's, Correct. that's the taught. So, you know, those guys are six, four across the board, including Arden key, also on the edge, uh, rushing off either side. So, yeah, they, they they did impress me. That defense did impress me. I think they're going to be uh, a pretty good defense to deal with in this league. they got some names at every every level of that defense. Uh, the running game, longest run late in the game by uh, Swift for 20 yards. So, again, a building block. Got to get better at running the football. Yeah, I mean, that's a work in progress. And, again, if, if they would have rushed for 200 yards, it would have never been a finished product. Every single week you face a different – type of talent against a different defense and you have points of emphasis accordingly and I think the better understanding that the offensive lineman gets with the rhythm of the cadence now this week's going to be a different monster because in Houston they're not going to be able to hear the snap count because the noise will be so deafening but again you don't want to get away from the running game I think that's always going to be your bread and butter But after you go in and you watch a tape as a group, as an offensive line or as a running back group, you get a better understanding, a better feel how plays are going to open up and then how how to pre-predict where your best chances of success are. So, like I said, any facet that needs improvement, the running game needs improvement, but I think it will uh, with Chris Morgan at the helm. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois right here at home, driving access toward healthier communities through it all. Let's talk about Chris Morgan, offensive line uh, at right guard. Nate Davis played 18 snaps, and uh, Bates played 38 snaps. So they rotated a bit. I think the first uh, snap was the 14th snap of the game for Bates, or 13th or 14th snap. Uh, they're, they're basically, I don't know how to evaluate it other than, you know, they're, they're evaluating both guys and see what, what lands is the better option. Is this what your thinking is here? Uh, you know, I would, I would hope they're all being evaluated because no one ever has a job forever. And that's the, when you have a group of talent that you put out there and Chris Morgan does a great job of playing guys in a variety of positions to see when their opportunity comes, who fits best where. And Ryan Bates was brought in here possibly to be the starting center, but after as he had an injury hiccup, he kind of was able to get more reps at right guard when Nate Davis wasn't in the lineup. So I think they're still going through the thinking and the development process because I think like guys like Amagaji, when he gets more practice time, maybe he'll, you know, work his way into some opportunities and we'll see how it works up and down the line of scrimmage. Wanted to talk about the first snap offensively of the game because Darnell Wright lined up on the outside of the left tackle, Braxton Jones. So that was an unbalanced line. What, what is the point of that? What is the, uh, What is the scheme value of that, especially on the first snap of the game? Point of attack advantage where you have better blockers next to each other and not necessarily taking anything away from the tight end position, but when you have two big offensive tackles next to each other and you know that's going to be your point of attack, which I think resulted in a six or eight yard run. Six yard, yeah, six. It's just shifting the defense out of position, creating a stronger side to the offense that's bona fide declaration most of the time where you're going to run. It doesn't, you don't have to, but now say they come out and unbalanced balance line the next time they run a play action to the opposite side so it just provides more preparation for your next opponent and it creates immediate thinking by the coordinator that's up in the booth looking down at the scheme so the defensive coordinator now is starting to say okay the next time they're in this defense let's go with this type of defensive scheme you know, and so I, I like the variety and I like the result of the play I believe I was it the only time they did it yesterday? Yeah. So a little bait on the fish hook. That's Correct. what they let. They exactly. put a little bait. bait the- <laughs> uh, this is interesting. Uh, 
week one gets so much over analysis, but for those who research these things, the lowest passing yard total in the league in a week one, not including the Monday night game, since 2010. Passing touchdowns way down to 33, and last year I believe it was 36. From 19 to 22, 2019 uh, to 2022, the touchdown totals, passing touchdowns were in the 50s and 60s. Is there anything you can derive from this trend down in passing yards and passing touchdowns? Well, I, I think of look at how many quarterbacks went to new teams, how many quarterbacks are playing for the first time at rookies, how many quarterbacks are in their second year, you know, whether it's Bryce Young or Will Levis, that are their uh, careers are still undetermined. I just don't think you have an extensive amount of quarterbacks that are senior leaders of their squad that are with a new with a, a head coach that's been around for a while. Or a coordinator, and, yeah. In a system or a coordinator. So Jim Harbaugh and Justin Herbert. Or else, you know, you look at Kirk Cousins in Atlanta. You look at Caleb in Chicago. You look at Darnold in Minnesota. Uh, you can go up and down the go board Go to Pittsburgh here. with Arthur Smith, and it turned right. out to be um, Justin and, Fields and instead Justin, of... Justin, you yeah. know, and then you got... You know, tonight you're going to have Aaron Rodgers, who played four plays for the Jets last year, 40 years old, coming off of an Achilles. And just like Kirk Cousins. So, I mean... Yeah, 10 new starters at quarterback in week one. Correct. 10. And then then if you look at those other teams that don't have the 10 new starters, look at the coaching changes that they've had. Or do you, as Deshaun Watson, who is coming off of an injury. So there's a lot of uncertainty. Steinhoffels is an employee-owned furniture and mattress store. Visit any of their four Chicagoland locations in Vernon Hills, Crystal Lake, Downers Grove, and Harwood Heights, or shop online at steinhoffels.com. Didn't get into injuries uh, specifically with Matt Eberflus at the podium with the media today at Hallis Hall. Did uh, send up a flare. A Roma Dunze getting an MRI on his knee. I don't know if you noticed anything in the game where uh, that may have occurred. Something may have occurred with that knee. And it may have been on a blocking play, according to Flus. Yeah, I, I didn't see a noticeable limp, and I didn't have any time during the game that I was overly concerned about his well being. So. You know, hopefully it's nothing, but, you know, it's better to be, you know, take precautionary measures. Yeah, I have to check on Keenan Allen as well. He left the game, and I don't believe he returned after coming up uh, limping on an end zone throw that uh, did not land. So things to things to always worry about injury-wise each week in the NFL. All right, let's take a quick sneak peek at the Houston Texans. Uh, they held off the Indianapolis Colts on the road. They won on the road 29-27. Uh, we're going to be seeing Anthony Richardson a week after, and he had a couple of uh, big plays, big throws. Uh, Alec Pierce, the local product out of Glen Allen, 120-some yards, including a 60-yard touchdown, and uh, he ran. Uh, Richardson ran for one. Uh, what, what? I don't know if you had any chance to look at Houston yet. What are we seeing on tape? We know the names. There's a lot of big names on both sides of the ball. I, you know, I looked at them a little bit um, just to see kind of what they were – trying to showcase on the road in Indianapolis, and they still featured the running game. You know, Joe Mixon, 30 carries. Oh, you know. 159. 59 yards. Three passes caught on three targets. They have some big-time receivers down there. Um, they're coming in with a quarterback, uh, the C.J. Stroud, that is just oozing with confidence. And he's got accuracy. He's a big guy. Uh, the He's got a offensive line that played well enough on the road to get those guys a two-point win. And then they have a defensive head coach who's got some explosiveness on the edge. And um, whenever you have edge explosiveness, especially when you're playing at home, you know that you can create a, a barrier around a young quarterback that means that he's either got to stay inside the pocket and get the ball out of his hands or else your edge blockers, tackles, and tight ends, they got to play the game of their life without ever hearing the snap count. So there's kind of a, a double-edged sword there with outside rushers that are that's what they're known for by offensive tackles who are not going to be able to hear the snap count. Will Anderson, the rookie of the year last year uh, from Alabama, and Daniil Hunter, they combined for just three tackles. So I, I, I haven't watched it either. I don't know if they kept stayed away from them. 
uh, doubled them up. I don't know what they did, but well, you uh, know they were quiet. A, a lot of their rushes contain specific to a guy like Anthony Richardson because if you let him get outside the pocket, he, he could take it the distance no matter where he is on the field. So when you're specifically telling your great outside rushers up, field and then close in on the pocket you're really giving that quarterback probably an extra three quarters of a second to a second in order to set your feet and get rid of the ball and I I just think that's the process because when you're playing on the road the offensive lineman's getting off the ball before the defensive ends when you're playing at home the defensive ends are getting off the ball as at the same rate as your offensive tackle. Well, I'd imagine, I mean, they don't want Caleb Williams out of the pocket making his uh, great throws on the run. He, he he did yesterday. He made a couple of nice throws on the run again. That's his, that's his big uh, superpower. You know, Caleb, the, you know, when you look at what is he new to, you know, how can he improve, you know, between one week and the next? And I think, you know, when you have time, take your time. Don't hurry your mechanics because you think that things are coming, uh, they are closing too close. Or you got to get rid of the ball too soon. And I do think the more reps that he gets at home and at, away, he'll be able to get a little bit more relaxed. And I think that's when you're going to see the best out of Caleb. Good news, Chicago United Airlines getting brand new planes with all the bells and whistles like Bluetooth connectivity, screens at every seat and room for everyone's roller bag. United, proud to fly the Chicago Bears. And you too. It was a heck of a weekend in Chicago for Bears fans. They had alumni weekend, a lot of old faces uh, coming into town and uh, reminiscing not only Saturday night at the dinner, but also on the sidelines before the game. And then it all results in a, uh, a big victory for the Bears. I say big because everyone is, and you're bankrolling the future. Uh, that's what you're doing by getting these tough, tough wins. And now you hit the road to take on Houston. Uh, that AFC South is a pretty – Pretty tough. That that AFC South is going to be. Is it? Wait till the end of the year and see. But that is a tough division. That's a tough yeah. division. The Bears got three of those games in the first three weeks of the season. So it's going to be interesting. And uh, we'll re- we'll recap uh, what that might look like as far as the Bears in Houston on Thursday in our next podcast. I hope to have uh, some um, guests of interest for you as well. And uh, of course, Bears Weekly on Thursday night. Jim Miller will join us on Bears Weekly this this week. Well, All we right. have plenty of talk about from Sunday, so I think we'll have that much to talk about leading up to this week's game. Absolutely. All right, that's going to do it. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you coming up later this week. For Tom Thayer and for Coach Eberflus, I'm Jeff Joniak. Bear down, everybody.